This week, it's smoke-free done right and smoke-free done wrong. Ain't nothing to it, but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape, Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending 27 August, 2022. This week, at the heart of the battle between smoking and smoking cessation, is a stat investigative article supported by a grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies, written by Nicholas Florco and his intern, Elise Well. We find a convoluted conversation about vaping. From the very first paragraph, it states, the Food and Drug Administration has spent more than four years trying to decide whether retailers should be able to sell products like cotton candy flavored liquids, vapes made to look like fidget spinners, and disposables filled with more nicotine than 200 cigarettes. And so far, the agency has explicitly ordered hundreds of them off the market. But a stat investigation found that vaping companies are regularly flouting the FDA's orders. They're making, stocking, and selling the illicit goods. And the agency is just letting it happen. The defiance is on display at thousands of smoke shops across the country and at countless more online retailers. It goes on to bring forth prime examples of websites and companies ignoring FDA orders, and then blames the FDA for not using its power to rein in bad actors. Talking about how the federal agency has sweeping legal authorities to crack down on vape companies ignoring its bans, and how the FDA should start levying seven-figure fines to physically pull products off shelves. But instead, the FDA is doing one worse. It's closing out warning letter cases because the company complied with the FDA warning, but not going after the company for countless other products that are still being sold. The article even quotes Matt Meyer saying, the FDA has been a toothless tiger that the industry isn't afraid to ignore. And now has even disclosed Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and this website both take money from Bloomberg Philanthropies. But the one thing this article does not mention is how the FDA hasn't made a list of what products are legal for sale in the United States and what products are still under their PMTA review process. In fact, if you look back on my previous 5-Minute Friday news report, you'll find the FDA released over 14 Excel sheets to inform the public what products submitted PMTAs and which of these the FDA has already denied. But there isn't a readily available list of pending authorizations. And there isn't a list of illegal products either. So my question is, what are shops supposed to be doing? Are they supposed to just close business, say, oh, well, well, I guess since the FDA, you know, has, you know, completely bungled its duty to protect public health and not given us a list of what we should or shouldn't be selling, well, we'll just close up shop. And the article even admits that this is exactly what vape shops are saying. Vape shops, for their part, argue that the FDA orders aren't clear enough until they understand exactly what's illegal and what's not illegal. They're just going to keep on operating. Vape shops are doing their best, despite a complete lack of clarity or transparency from the agency to piece together what products are still legally able to be sold, said Amanda Wheeler, the president of the American Vapor Manufacturers Association. It would be legally and morally reprehensible for us to recommend that companies 
should voluntarily close down their businesses because the FDA cannot sort out their filing systems. The article then briefly talks about how the FDA was all mandated by Congress to regulate these new tobacco products by extending existing cigarette and cigar rules to vaping products. Yet he fails to provide a relatable comparison. Ask anyone who vapes and they will tell you that vaping is not smoking. The only similarity between smoking and vaping is how people vape to get the nicotine that they used to get from smoking. That is where the similarity ends for ends. Do cigarettes have batteries? Do cigarettes have mods allowing the user to adjust the amount of emissions put out by their cigarette? Do cigarettes stop making emissions when the smoker isn't using the lit cigarette? Do cigarettes allow the user to pick between high emission cigarettes and low emission cigarettes? Do cigarettes allow a smoker to lower the temperature of what they breathe in? Do cigarettes allow the smoker to increase the concentration of air that they breathe in when they smoke? Or is the smoker's only option to smoke covering the air holes on the filter or sticking far out to leave them completely exposed? Can smokers decrease the airflow resistance of a cigarette or is it fixed by the filter? Can smokers choose a higher nicotine content cigarette so that they're going to smoke less? Or is that exclusively an option with vaping? The answers are obvious for any smoker who quit and now chooses a 95 to 99% safer vaping product over their smoking habit. But the article ignores the obvious and moves on to the history of PMTA's permission to sell reduced harm products. In the intervening years, countless companies sold their products without FDA permission, and the vaping industry boomed. Juul grew from a small 200-person company to a $15 billion enterprise with a 1,500-person workforce. Overall, e-cigarette sales increased six-fold from $304.2 million in 2015 to $2.06 billion in 2018, according to a recent government study. Last year, the FDA finally started formally denying some companies' requests to sell their products. In many cases, the companies just ignore them complaining that the regulatory process was too burdensome or even overreaching. Do you think that the author would have bothered to look into why these companies said that the regulatory process was too burdensome or why they said that the FDA was overreaching? Of course not. Doing so would have revealed how the EU and the UK do things so differently than the US FDA. The EU and the UK have a regulatory framework where any company can manufacture vaping products so long as they stay within regulatory boundaries. This means that the total nicotine content limits must be observed. It also means that there's a prohibited list of ingredients that cannot be used in e-liquids. And before the product goes out, for sale, they must be tested to document that they don't release prohibited levels of known harmful substances. It is so much simpler than what the United States FDA has. In the United States, if you want to sell a vaping product, you must submit every possible variation of that product separately as its own. PMTA. Even the tiniest variation of the labeling on your product requires 
a complete PMTA. You want to sell a flavor? A single flavor profile of e-liquid? Well, that's awesome, says the FDA. Just submit a complete and comprehensive PMTA. That's potentially more complicated than if you were to create a brand new drug. You need labeling examples, environmental studies, lab analysis, studies on the users of the product, and even studies on non-users of the product. How is your new single flavor e-liquid going to affect some non-user of your product in Sunburst, Montana, with a population of 333? How are the 150 households and the 107 families in Sunburst, Montana, going to be affected by your tobacco product? Show the FDA your marketing plan that's going to protect the public health of this town where the per capita income is just $20,244. Document how your product will protect the public health of this town. If, for example, the librarian, Lindsay Sandin, buys it and uses it while reading a book at the North Toole County Library. And while you're at it, the FDA needs an environmental study to document what happens if Lindsay doesn't like your flavor and throws the Lee liquid bottle on the train tracks behind the Sunburst gas station. Seems a bit excessive, don't you think? Well, how about if you wanted to sell this liquid in, oh, I don't know, multiple nicotine strengths, like 3, 6, 12, 18, 35, maybe 50 milligram concentrations? And maybe, just maybe, you might want to sell a bottle of e-liquid with no nicotine in it whatsoever. So, you know, if a smoker wanted to taper their way down, well, they would easily be able to do that all on their own. I mean, that sounds fantastic to me. Well, guess what? Each of these variations is going to need their very own PMTA with their very own studies, which exponentially increases the cost to comply with FDA regulations. Your single PMTA, which, to be honest, was potentially thousands of pages long, has now turned into a mind-numbing pile of boxes you need a forklift to deliver to the FDA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I know, I know. It's 2022, and the manufacturers could easily submit these documents electronically. But doing so wouldn't negate the time that it's going to take for a human being at the FDA to actually read all this paperwork that you submitted, let alone sit there to evaluate its contents. And I didn't even get into how you'd have to show how your product emissions are going to vary depending on what device you choose to use it in. What if someone bought your e-liquid and used it to make nicotine brownies? How could you protect the health of the public when you don't know what your customers are going to go do with that product? And how could that product potentially impact the public health if it was misused in other ways? These are all things that the FDA wants answers to when you submit a PMTA application. And that's exactly how ridiculous the FDA requirements are for every PMTA company, for every product, from every single manufacturer that has gone down the road to try and get approval to sell their products in the United States. And I suspect it's also why the FDA has denied over 8 million applications and it only authorized three companies to sell their products. Yet none of this made it into the article. Instead, it focuses on the disagreement of scholars 
former FDA officials, and vape advocates. Yeah, the article does admit it's true that several studies have shown that vaping can be helpful to help people quit smoking. A recent literature review, for example, found that nicotine cigarettes probably do help smokers stop smoking for at least six months and probably work better than nicotine replacement therapy and nicotine-free e-cigarettes. But unfortunately, this article finishes off with statements from Brian King and Robert Califf before reaching another useless ending by an FDA spokesperson. We are looking at ways to be more efficient and effective. Hey, Nicholas Florco, if you want to be an investigative journalist, you need to ignore the demagoguery doldrums and focus on the big picture. Why has vaping grown? From a few ex-smoking business entrepreneurs into a multi-billion dollar industry. Think about that for a moment. Why were there literally 8 million PMTAs denied? And how are those denials now going to affect public health? You know, perhaps the reason that the FDA isn't cracking down on all these illegal products because they know that it's the only thing that's keeping the public not smoking. It's smoke-free done right versus smoke-free done wrong. Moving on. Speaking of smoke-free done right, UK vaping retailer VPZ eyes 10 openings and expansion plan. The UK's largest vaping retailer, VPZ, has revealed plans to open 10 more stores by the end of this year. It comes as the business called for the UK government to introduce tighter controls and licensing for selling vaping products. The business will increase its portfolio to 160 sites across England and Scotland, including in London and Glasgow. BPC made an announcement as it takes its mobile vape clinic on the road throughout the country. It comes as government ministers continue to promote vaping, with Public Health England claiming e-cigarettes carry a fraction of the risk of smoking. However, last month, Research indicated a steep rise in underage vaping over the last five years, according to Action on Smoking and Health. Doug Mutter, director of VPZ, said, As the UK's leading vape specialist, we are spearheading the fight against the nation's number one killer, smoking. Our plans to open 10 new stores and the launch of our mobile vape clinic responds 100% to our ambition to engage with more smokers throughout the country and help them take the first steps on their quit journey. The boss said, however, that the sector could be improved, calling for greater scrutiny of those selling products. Mr. Mutter said, at the moment, we have a challenge in the industry where imported many unregulated disposable vaping products are readily available from local convenience stores, supermarkets, and several other general retailers with no age verification control or regulation in many of these. We are urging the UK government to act now and follow best practices from countries like New Zealand, where flavored products can only be sold from specialist licensed vaping stores where a Challenge 25 policy is in place, and consultation is aimed towards adult smokers and vapors. VPZ is also in favor of substantial fines going to stop black market sellers. Does prohibition work? Or is it finally time to focus on the biggest problem and the world's number one killer, smoking? When are governments and people finally going to stop playing whack-a-mole 
and realize that the only way to win this battle is focusing on harm reduction. If a 12-year-old sees their family member smoking, what's that kid going to eventually do? It's common sense. I don't care how much you teach the kid not to do something or how doing that thing is going to harm them. You're going to have to watch out. That's going to kill you one day. I don't care how much you tell them that. Curiosity will one day get the better of them. And they will do what they're not supposed to do, even if just to find out what all the fuss is about. I mean, constantly. This is all we ever heard of when we were growing up. Aren't we getting tired of this never-ending cycle? When we grew up, it was just say no. Did that work? Did just say no work and stop people from using drugs? Smoking is going to kill you. Did that stop people from smoking? It didn't stop me. Using drugs is going to kill you. Oh, that doesn't work either, does it? Look, you can sit there and tell kids that, oh, you're going to die if you go and do this. Is that going to be in the kid's mind when they go and they pick that first one up? Maybe. Is it going to stop them from doing something if they really want to go and do it? We all know the obvious answer. Look, here's a kid that drowned from water. Oh, man, I think we need to go and ban water. No swimming pools, no bottled water, and no faucets that leach this deadly water. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Fish need water to live, and guess what? Humans do too. And maybe we all need a little bit of caffeine in our lives. And you know what? Since nicotine is absolutely no different than caffeine, then why can't the public consume nicotine in a safe way Whenever they feel like it, it's smoke-free done right versus smoke-free done wrong. And speaking of how smoke-free can be done wrong, the Australian Medical Association calls for stronger nicotine vaping product regulation. From the Australian Medical Association, as the take-up of vaping grows, the AMA president Professor Steve Robson has written to the federal health minister urging changes to legislation. The letter to Minister for Health and H Care, the Honorable Mark Butler MP, was sent earlier this week and addressed serious issues with the current nicotine vaping products regulations. In the letter, Professor Robinson outlined the health risks associated with vaping which is increased among adolescents and young adults, and is a gateway to cigarette smoking. Vaping can also create harmful effects such as seizures and nicotine poison and e-cigarette-associated lung injury. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We have to stop here. This is all wrong. And the Australian Medical Association knows that it's wrong. Vaping does not lead to smoking. Well, except if it's banned and smoking is the only option left, vaping also does not cause harmful effects such as seizures and nicotine poisoning and e-cigarette-associated lung injury, which I'm not going to call Viali. You heard it here first, folks. It's called Viali because it's caused by vitamin E acetate associated lung injury. It is not the e-cigarette that caused the lung injury. It's what was put inside that black market tainted THC cart that caused these lung injuries. And it all stemmed from a single supply source. And the man who sold those tainted carts, guess what? He's been caught 
and he's been sent to prison. But I bet you didn't know that. This whole hysteria over Viali can be tied back to a single black market supplier and any other injured person who DIY'd their own THC cart the exact same way. The only way to get nicotine poisoning is to drink or spill very high concentrations of e-liquid onto exposed skin. It is not possible to commit suicide by vaping alone. You can pass out from vaping too much. Yeah. You can throw up because you vape too much. But that all happens way before the levels of nicotine in your blood get to the, be a point where it's lethal. And here's the science to prove it. How much nicotine kills a human? Tracing back the generally accepted lethal dose to dubious self-experiments in the 19th century. Nicotine is a toxic compound that should be handled with care, but the frequent warnings of potential fatalities caused by ingestion of small amounts of tobacco products or diluted nicotine-containing solutions are unjustified and need to be revised in light of the overwhelming data indicating that more than 0.5 grams of oral nicotine is required to kill an adult. That is 500 to 1,000 milligrams of ingested nicotine, corresponding to 6.5 to 13 milligrams per kilogram orally. So for a 100 kilogram adult, that's 650 to 1,300 milligrams of nicotine. And for a 10 kilogram infant or toddler, that's 65 to 130 milligrams of nicotine. Yes, folks, I know there are scientific papers which state higher levels are required, and there are scientific papers that state lower levels are required. But one thing we do know is that for every cigarette smoked, a smoker intakes approximately two milligrams of nicotine. That is at least 40 milligrams of nicotine per pack. Three packs a day. Results in heavy smokers like I was easily consuming 120 milligrams of nicotine every single day. And since this is normal usage, you need to stop and think for a second why some smokers absolutely need to have 50 milligram nicotine from a disposable vape using two milliliters of 50 milligram joules in one day is less than the 120 milligrams of nicotine that they would have got from combusting cigarettes. And it's not even going to talk about or cover how there's 7,000 other toxicants found in cigarette smoke, but they're completely absent inside of a vape. Yet the AMA wants to, Number one, reduce the concentration limit allowed under therapeutic goods order 110 from 100 milligrams per milliliter to 20 milligrams per milliliter and introduce limits on flavors and the volume of nicotine that can be prescribed or ordered. Number two, ban the importation of NVPs through the personal importation scheme. Number three, work with state and territory governments to add NVPs to real-time prescription monitoring programs to reduce the risk of doctor shopping. Number four, amend MBS telehealth smoking cessation items so that only a patient's usual doctor may prescribe NVPs as a smoking cessation tool. Number five, work with state and territory governments to deal with this issue more consistently and strategically. 
including better enforcement of e-cigarette laws to prevent the illegal sale of these products, especially to young people. There is so much wrong with all these recommendations. I don't even know where to start. I just explained how much a three pack a day smoker uses every single day and why they need higher doses to quit. DIY nicotine additions have become the standard in Australia because of this whole ridiculous prescription model. And there are far too few GPs who even know how to properly write a nicotine script. And now the AMA wants to stop telehealth and require smokers to only see their usual GP who may not even have gotten the required training to write a nicotine script? Real-time prescription monitoring programs? Are we talking about opioids or nicotine? And where do I even go with better enforcement of e-cigarette laws? I mean, look at the black market you have for regular cigarettes in Australia. What happens when you ban an illegal product that's already banned? What are you going to do next? How do you ban something that's already been banned effectively? Maybe the reason why you've got such a black market problem is because you're so hard on getting people to get legal access to the products. Just because you ban something is not going to get people to stop going and getting what they want. I mean, how fundamental common sense can we get before these people understand what's going on right now? I got a radical idea for you, okay? How about you eliminate the actual harmful products known as combustible cigarettes? How about you go and you get rid of that before you get rid of the crutch that smokers are using to not smoke? Australia can't even mitigate the black market combustible tobacco products that they have now. And now the AMA wants to add vaping products into the enforcement issue that needs more legislation. It's utter rubbish. Border Protection and Customs can't handle the illegal goods that they've already got to look out for and try and find. You think that making it harder for law-abiding citizens to go and get a product that stops them from smoking is going to help the situation? Are you, go are you bloody bonkers, man? Have you lost your mind? In Australia, it's smoke-free done wrong. And smoke-free that they now want to do double wrong. The global tobacco product market is worth 907.66 billion US dollars. And globally, at a 2.78% CAGR, which means that by 2028, the market will grow from 782 billion to 907 billion US dollars. That is 1.3 trillion Aussie dollars by 2028. No laws can eliminate this kind of consumer demand. So the goal should clearly be a smoke-free, but not tobacco-free society. If there is any hope in saving lives, we must never, never force these products onto the black market. The only achievable solution is to legalize all of them for sale everywhere cigarettes are sold. 
reasonable manufacturing, safety regulations, and less tax than combustibles. That is the only way to eliminate the disease and death from burning tobacco. And we can do this now, or we can do this after another 50 years of failed regulations. Speaking of failed regulations, woman forced to move stores after two days at Clark's job for vaping at work. Coming from mylondon.news, a South London woman has been banned from entering her place of work after being accused of smoking at work, despite receiving no verbal warning from her store manager. Tia Weathers Henry had been working at Clark's in Lewisham, which is located within the larger Saintsbury branch on the South End Lane. Now, Despite living in Brexton, she has been transferred to a different Clark store in Brumley, as she has been banned from entering the Saintsbury's. Tia said she briefly vaped, though not on the shop floor. But it wasn't seen by everyone. The Saintsbury manager saw smoke in the area near Tia and automatically accused her of smoking a cigarette. Tia says, but added that he didn't see the vape or any cigarette. It was only her third day at the store when she was banned by the store manager, who refused to listen to Tia's explanation. Tia 19 told my London, he's come up to me and said, I want to see your manager. He told my assistant manager that I was smoking. One of my colleagues tried to speak to him, but he wasn't having any of it. He was going on a rant and being stubborn. He then left, printed out part of the policy, and came back to Clark's. He was reading it out in front of me and my colleagues. Tia continued, One of my colleagues jumped to my defense and said, She's new. She doesn't know all the rules. And he said, I don't care. I'm talking. He then went and got a female employee who came to escort me out of the building. I was very embarrassed and scared, and I felt very humiliated, because in that moment, I didn't cry, but I felt very angry at this person who was being stubborn. It was an honest mistake, and he took it too far. He could have given me a verbal warning and said, please don't do that again. I didn't even get to finish my shift. The day after, Tia and her mother went back to the store and tried to reason with the manager about the situation and how he had treated Tia. Regardless, Tia continues to be banned from the store and now has to make the eight-mile trip from Brixton to Brumley to work at another Clark store rather than her usual four-mile trip to Sydenham. A Saintsbury spokesman said, we are committed to being an inclusive retailer where people love to work and shop. The safety of all of our customers and colleagues is our highest priority, and we do not allow smoking of any kind, including vaping, in our stores. We are looking into what happened on this particular occasion. Here's what happened, okay? Vaping is not smoking. There is no smoke coming from a vape ever. If the person's using it, it is not possible. That is not smoke. That cannot hurt anyone. Even in the UK, the average citizen does not understand basic fundamental science. All they know is the constant misinformation present in fear-mongering scare stories. The FDA could have easily corrected course years ago and countless times along the way. The press 
could have easily prevented this from happening by focusing on all the facts and looking at the big picture. But instead, all we get is misinformation. And Bloomberg, prohibition is propaganda, forcing even ex-smokers to continue being harassed despite completely giving up smoking. Regardless of who you are, helping smokers quit should be the end game here. Malaysia must also come up with solid plans to manage tobacco addiction besides just imposing a blanket ban on smoking and vaping, said a public health expert. Malaysia Society for Harm Reduction Chairman, Professor Dr. Sharif Azat Won Puta, said a strong mechanism needs to be put in place to help chronic smokers kick the habit. While the government's proposed general end game is to impose a total ban on cigarettes and smoking for youngsters who were born after 2007 is good, there needs to be a mechanism where chronic smokers can fall back on. We need to help those who already have tobacco or nicotine addiction to quit. And for this, we should encourage the use of harm reduction products that can assist with this, said Dr. Shariza, a public health professor from University Kabangstan, Malaysia. She said countries like New Zealand and Britain have allowed vaping, albeit with some regulation, to help smokers quit smoking. Dr. Shariza added that there should be not a total ban on cigarette alternatives. If it could genuinely be used to help someone with an addiction. Even with a total prohibition on tobacco products, people will still find a way to gain access to it or find illicit products. So for those with addiction, we need them to switch from cigarettes to less harmful products. In the long run, they would quit altogether. That is the end game. The end game is more than offering less harmful products. It's also got to include being factual about the real harms of products. Is there really any harm from vaping? Seriously, what are the harms from vaping compared to smoking? You'll never hear the body part organizations do that. They don't want to admit how much safer this product is. It's why it's illegal in many countries for vape shops to tell their customers, this is better for you than smoking and it's better for your health to use this than smoking. I can say whatever I want because I don't own any vape retail outlet. I don't make any parts. I don't manufacture anything. I'm just another consumer of these products. So it's easy for me to point out the fact smoking will kill half of the 1.1 billion smokers around the globe. And this can save them all. Isn't the problem big enough already? Isn't 1.1 billion smokers around the globe big enough of a problem to get people to focus on it instead of the solution? If vaping was only 1% safer than smoking, shouldn't we do everything possible to get everyone on the planet to switch to a safer alternative product. I don't care what that person's age is. Wouldn't this be a logical choice? Isn't saving lives the ultimate goal? Isn't improving the health and well being of people the ultimate goal? Isn't that the end game? Well, it's even more ridiculous when you realize that vaping is 95 to 99.5% safer than smoking. The cancer risk from vaping 
is only 0.5% of that from smoking. 99.5% of all cancer that's caused by smoking could be prevented if vaping were the only option available. Why is it so hard for people to understand? Well, according to the Washington Times Examiner, it's because Michael Bloomberg has poured $1 billion into anti-tobacco groups shaping White House policy. Former failed presidential candidate and former New York mayor, Michael Bloomberg, has poured over a billion dollars into anti-tobacco groups that have pushed the Biden administration to ban menthol cigarettes, a move that critics fear will disproportionately affect black communities in the United States. Bloomberg Philanthropies boasts on his website that it has invested $1.1 billion in the fight against tobacco use over the past decade. Two of the groups that have received a share of that funding, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, or CTFK, and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, have seeded officials into the FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. The sub-agency behind the Biden administration's proposal in April to ban menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars. Did you get that? The formerly prestigious and independent Johns Hopkins School of Public Health is now the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And they seeded officials into the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. Whatever happened to science and independent government agencies being immune from bribery? Shouldn't Michael Bloomberg be executed for bribery? And considered a United States is still dealing with the painful loss of life every single year of 480,000 American lives? Shouldn't that be considered treason? His money is literally killing American lives, killing the sovereignty of Johns Hopkins and killed the US FDA from protecting the public health. Isn't this exactly what got him into trouble down in the Philippines with their FDA accepting money from Bloomberg Philanthropies? But it gets even worse, folks. More than 80% of black smokers use menthol cigarettes. Activists and law enforcement officials have expressed concern that if the FDA finalizes its menthol ban, it could lead to a law enforcement crackdown that will disproportionately target the black community. The second that this menthol ban goes into effect, cigarettes are going to become contraband. And once they become contraband, law enforcement officers will have no choice but to deal with the illicit market. Elliot Boyce, the director of the New York State Police Employee Assistance Program, told the FDA during the public comment period on June 13th. The FDA said its proposal will only target tobacco manufacturers, retailers, and distributors. Importantly, the FDA cannot and will not enforce against individual consumers for possession or use of menthol products or flavored cigars, the FDA said of its proposed menthol ban in April. Eric Garner, a black man, was killed by a New York City police officer in 2014 as he was being arrested after illegally selling cigarettes on a street corner because he was selling a Lucy. Many conservative commentators and lawmakers opinion at the time of Garner's killing. The New York sky high cigarette taxes 
incentivized him to participate in this illegal cigarette market. In November 2013, about eight months before Garner's killing, Bloomberg signed legislation into law as New York City's mayor that raised taxes on cigarettes in the city and cracked down on cigarette tax evasion. Other experts have expressed concerns that America's already bustling contraband cigarette market will explode if the FDA enacts this menthol ban. An estimated 1.9 billion packs of cigarettes were consumed in 2020 alone across the United States. As a result of smokers seeking to evade sky-high local excise taxes, according to an analyst at McKinnack Center. McKinnack Center Senior Director Michael LaFive told the Washington Examiner the participants of the illegal drug market, including criminal cartels south of the border, are probably salivating at the prospect of becoming the only source of menthol cigarettes in the United States if the FDA enacts this ban. When you talk about banning a particular product that remains popular, you are invariably inviting illicit market participants to expand their supply chains. In this case, it's going to be mostly international. Drug cartels, LaFive said, are very sensitive to these types of opportunities. They see it with the drug trade. It would be no surprise if they ramped up the movement of illicit smokes throughout the country. Edgar Dominic, the former deputy director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, also warned the FDA during public comments in June that the agency's proposed menthol ban would create a perfect storm for organized crime groups to further entrench themselves in the illicit tobacco industry. While the regulated industry will adhere to new regulations, the reality is that organized crime groups will saturate the market with illegitimate and unregulated tobacco products. CTFK has received $166 million from Bloomberg Philanthropies since 2008, boasting on its website that it led the outside effort to pass the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, a 2009 law that authorized the FDA to regulate the manufacturing, marketing, and sale of tobacco products. CTFK spokesman Dave Lamont told the Washington Examiner the group's advocacy for the 2009 law was not funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies. Quote, until 2019, Bloomberg Philanthropies funded only our global work, Lamont said. Two years later, in 2011, former CTFK Director of Federal Relations, Grayson Fowler, joined the Office of Policy at the newly formed FDA CTP, a role he still holds, according to his LinkedIn page. In February 2021, CTFK published a report that called on the FDA to ban menthol cigarettes. Two months later, in April, the FDA announced it was beginning to work toward issuing proposed rules to ban menthol as a cigarette flavor additive. The same day of the FDA's announcement that it would begin moving to ban menthol cigarettes, CTFK published a lengthy statement celebrating the Biden administration's truly historic announcement and urged the FDA to move swiftly to propose, finalize, and implement the necessary regulations to turn this decision into life-saving action. CTFK acknowledged in June 2021 that tobacco laws are often enforced disproportionately against black and brown people. After police in Ocean City, Maryland violently arrested black teenagers for vaping in public. Are you fucking kidding me? 
My Father's Day news report was forced to be about how a black kid was tased to the ground for simply removing his backpack. Five cops surrounded this kid for vaping. And all of them are sitting there yelling instructions for this kid to comply. This panicked kid. One cop tells him to take off his backpack. So he starts to reach and take off his backpack. And another kid, another cop, decides to tase this kid into unconsciousness for following the instructions of another officer. Do you honestly think that it's going to be any different if they ban menthol cigarettes? If they ban menthol cigarettes, cops are going to have probable cause to search any black, brown, or white person who smokes. It's just a matter of time before somebody gets shot by the police for smoking. Despite this, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids was among the signatories in an August 2nd letter that implored the FDA to finalize its menthol ban, saying there was no justification or excuse to further delay banning the additive. TTFK also expressed admiration for foreign leaders who have taken a hard line on enforcing tobacco prohibition policies. For example, TTFK lauded former Philippines President Rodrigo Duarte in a 2017 strategy memo obtained by the Competitive Ed Enterprise Institute for his progressive policies on tobacco control and said his 2017 nationwide public smoking ban, which imposed penalties for up to four months in prison, created unprecedented opportunities for tobacco control. More than 12,000 Filipinos were killed during Duarte's war on drugs, according to Human Rights Watch. Folks, I'm sick to death of the constant loss of life from these do-gooders doing the opposite of what is needed in this useless war on drugs. Whatever happened? to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness from the Declaration of Independence. Maybe Jefferson should have stuck with his first rough draft so people could easily understand or better comprehend it today. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal and independent that from that equal creation, they derive rights inherent and inalienable, among which are the preservation of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. If all men are created equal and independent, then everyone should have the opportunity to do as they please. So long as what you do does not interfere with my rights to do as I please, and what I do does not interfere with you being able to do what you want to do, we are all equal and independent. The vaping industry was founded by smokers who found a way to preserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They empowered smokers to choose a healthier option. And smokers love it so much that they're quitting at record numbers. From a single imported product to a multi-billion dollar industry, vaping is unquestionably the disruptive technology solution to smoking. 82 million ex-smokers use it every single day to not smoke and not a single one of them has died from nicotine vaping. If left unattended, the world could easily see the end of cigarette combustion in less than a decade. 
countries like the UK and New Zealand could easily achieve their smoke-free 2030 or smoke-free 2025 goals. But Michael Bloomberg and the FDA want no parts of it. Ask yourself why. Daily smoking rates in Aotearoa, New Zealand, have dropped from 18% in 2006 to 9.4%. Youth smoking rates have plummeted from 14% in 2006 to 1.1%. Why aren't we doing the same thing as New Zealand? Smoking prevalence among adults in England is now at a record low of 13.9%. New data from the UCL Smoking Toolkit study showed that in England in 2020, there has been an increase of nearly a quarter, 22% in quit attempts compared to 2019, and an increase of almost two-thirds in the quitting success rate from 14% to 23%. Why aren't we doing the same thing as in the UK? Our quit success rates like six, 7% in this country. Why isn't vaping allowed to extinguish smoking? Why is Australia and the United States treating smoking and the solution to smoking the exact same? Don't these people realize Vaping is the cure to combustible cigarettes. Don't these people realize that the only thing vaping kills is smoking? Well, here's the latest propaganda from New South Wales. Once again, grouping vaping and smoking together and using kids to spread the propaganda. When smoking makes you sick, <coughs> country is sick. Start a new beginning and care for yourself. The way you do country. Barat Bunda. Contact the Barat Bunda team and start your journey to quit smoking today. Barat Bunda team. Yeah, Google Bada Bunda team to start your journey to quit smoking today. Once again, Australia tightens the screws further on the vaping nicotine. The previous national tobacco strategy, 2012 to 2018, was an embarrassing failure. A target of 10% adult daily smoking was set for 2018, but only 13.8% was achieved in Australia. The draft 2022 to 2030 strategy has now set the same target of 10% for 2025. However, without ready access to vaping, this goal is certain to be missed once again. In Australia, it will remain much easier to buy deadly cigarettes than the far safer alternative. In sharp contrast, neighboring New Zealand recently set a 2025 daily adult smoking target of less than 5% for all population groups in its smoke-free Air Terror 2025 action plan. Vaping is a key element of this plan. Those who are not ready to quit or unable to quit now have an alternative at much less cost and much less risk to their health. According to this chart, the Aussie government got it all wrong. New Zealand is much better source on how to get people to quit smoking. So folks, my suggestion would be to check out vapingfacts.health.nz and find a pleasurable way to accidentally quit smoking. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending August 27th, 2022. I sincerely appreciate all of you that are leaving me comments week after week. 
apologize for the rant this week, but it's hard not to be passionate about this, especially when you see how many people are dying and they keep dying because of the lunacy from people like Bloomberg and the FDA. However, I want you to know it really is a pleasure bringing you the latest facts, the latest vaping science, and the latest advocacy news that's out there. I hope you guys have a fantastic week ahead. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. Have a great day. Are you kidding me? The article even admits to this fact. Let's try this again. <laughs>